On our newscast tonight, they are working overtime at Panmunjom, South and North Korea, trying to come to an agreement on the reunion of families separated during the Korean War. We have the latest. Japan gives a green light to revisions of school textbooks making false claims to the Korea-controlled Tokdo Island, a move that has South Korea seeing red. Korean authorities continue to fight an uphill battle on preventing the further spread of avian influenza. And with the mass exodus of the Lunar New Year around the corner, sterilization facilities will be up and running in bus terminals, expressways, train stations, and more. For these stories, stay with us for Early Edition at 6. It is 4 a.m. in Washington, 10 in Auschwitz, and 6 on a Tuesday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Gwon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. We begin with Japan's continued proud inability to accept historical facts. The Korean government called in the Japanese ambassador to Seoul on this Tuesday to lodge a formal protest over school teaching manual revisions bolstering Tokyo's claim to Korean-controlled Tokdo Island. And in a separate statement, Seoul's foreign ministry threatened unspecified reciprocal countermeasures if the revisions are not withdrawn immediately. Our Oh Jinju has our top story. How much further can Korea-Japan relations sink? The Japanese government has decided to define the Korea-controlled Tokdo Island and a disputed island chain in the East China Sea as its own territory in its revised manual on government guidelines for teachers in middle and high school textbooks. Seoul's foreign ministry summoned Japanese ambassador to Korea, Korobetsu, in response and lodged a protest. I'm here to convey our government's grave opposition to Japan's education ministry, as it today maliciously included its reckless claims in the teaching guidelines for middle schools and high schools. The Korean government condemned the new teaching guidelines and demanded the plan be withdrawn immediately. If they're not, Seoul vowed to carry out appropriate measures. The Japanese government has continued to make false claims over Tokdo, which is the first victim of Japanese imperialistic plunder. And trying to teach it to future generations clearly shows that it has not moved beyond the nostalgia of its past imperialism and its evil practice of distorting history. The new manual unveiled by the Japanese government Tuesday includes a statement that Korea is, quote, illegally occupying Takashima, which is what Japan calls the islets, and that the Japanese government is protesting the action. On the islands called Senkaku in Japan and Diaoyu in China, Tokyo says it is effectually controlling the island chain and that there are no territorial disputes to resolve. Japan will educate about Japanese territory and will also look to have friendly relations with surrounding countries. I don't see any contradiction between these two things. In 2008, the Japanese government included a statement in its manual that called the Tokdo Island issue between Korea and Japan as a, quote, difference in opinion. Even then, when Japan did an outright claim Tokdo as its territory in the manual, the two nations' ties were under great strain. But now with Tokyo putting their stance into stronger language, it's hard to see relations improving anytime soon. Oh Jinju, Arirang News. With tensions in Northeast Asia rising over Japan's refusal to acknowledge its wartime atrocities, acts quite contrary to that of Japan are taking place on the other side of the globe. Germany, Poland and other countries held ceremonies on Monday to remember the victims of the Holocaust and ensure that such horrors are never repeated, our Sun jung -in reports. Germany's parliament held its annual ceremony to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day on Monday with government representatives and guests from other nations. The sound of a string quartet resonated inside the hall where the ceremony took place while Holocaust survivors laid wreaths and flowers to honor the victims of the genocide. Monday's commemorations come 69 years after Soviet soldiers swept into Auschwitz, the former death camp in Poland, to liberate the roughly 7,000 people still interned there. 
German lawmakers expressed their sympathy for the survivors who are still suffering in the aftermath of the war. Never should anyone be discriminated against or threatened by differences in political beliefs, religion or gender. Germany no longer acknowledges prejudice against other ethnic groups. Russian author and Holocaust survivor Daniel Granin, who was transported to Auschwitz in 1944 after a Nazi siege, was invited to describe his memories of the horrific experience. It took me a long time to forgive Germany. That's how horrendous a war is. It's stained with blood. Many people toured the Auschwitz compound, including officials from the Israeli parliament, who visited the site to remember its liberation by Russian soldiers in 1945. Germany has since apologized for the suffering inflicted by its troops and said they feel for the survivors who are still dealing with the consequences of war. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, amid seemingly thawing relations between the two Korea, South Korea on Monday proposed holding a fresh round of reunions for families separated since the Korean War in the third week of February. Now, Seoul also suggested holding working level talks Wednesday, uh, tomorrow that is, to fine tune the details of the event. So, do we have a response from the North yet? For that, let's go live to our correspondent Hwang Sung Hee at the Unification Ministry. Now, Sung Hee, uh, North Korea has asked the hotline at the inter Korean uh, border to be left open after its working hours, but still no word yet. That's right, Kanyang. Still no response from North Korea, although we are expecting an answer sometime later today. Now, like you said, North Korea earlier asked to leave the inter-Korean hotline open for a little bit longer than its usual closing time of 4 p.m. Now, if, the, uh, if we do get a response from North Korea, the two Koreas will mostly likely, most likely meet for uh, working level talks tomorrow at the North Korean side of the truce village of Panmunjom to discuss the details as proposed by Seoul yesterday. There is also the possibility of Pyongyang making a counter proposal for the dates of the reunion. The dates that Seoul proposed are from February 17th to the 22nd, which is right before it begins its annual joint military drills with Washington. Uh, experts say that North Korea may ask to schedule the reunions during the military exercise to pressure the South to cancel the drills or scale them back. Nonetheless, the Unification Ministry said that if the North proposes a different date for justifiable reasons, it is willing to put these under consideration. Guys? And Sonia, is it true that the North Korea actually called on the South to stop a West Sea naval exercise scheduled for this afternoon? That's right, Daniel. Um, Seoul's defense ministry said today that Pyongyang, through a military hotline on the western sea border, demanded that Seoul stop a naval exercise, threatening severe consequences if it continues with its plans. The ministry said it sent a reply shortly thereafter, saying it's a regular exercise and adding its hope that the drills will not affect the possible plans for resuming family reunions. The ministry says it notified the North of the exercise on Sunday. Now, this is in line with the South Korean government's stance that humanitarian issues such as the resumption of family reunions will be dealt separately with such military drills. Guys? All right, thank you, Sangi, for that. That was our Hwang Sangi reporting live on Seoul's proposal to hold family reunions next month from Seoul's Unification Ministry. The Korean government on this Tuesday issued special pardons for nearly 6,000 people who committed minor crimes in the course of trying to make a living. Justice Minister Hwang gyo -won said that a total of 5,925 people were pardoned ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, which starts Thursday. Now, in addition, about 2.9 million traffic violators will be exempted from their penalties. However, the list of beneficiaries will not include people caught driving under the influence. Prominent politicians, businessmen and offenders of violent crimes will also be excluded from the list of those pardoned. The special pardons are the first since President Park Geun-hye took office last year. Korean presidents have traditionally issued pardons to commemorate major national holidays. 
Now, quarantine officials here in Korea appear to be fighting a losing battle as they attempt to contain the spread of bird flu in this country. More and more suspected cases are popping up in areas that were previously unaffected by the virus. Our Kwon Tua has the latest. Despite mass sterilizations on the ground and in the skies, the culling of ducks and chickens in the hundreds of thousands, and movement bans on livestock and farm workers, a rising number of bird flu cases are being reported throughout Korea. An AI case at a duck farm in Cheonan in the southern Chungcheong Namdo province was confirmed on Tuesday, prompting authorities to decide to cull over 40,000 ducks and chickens in a three kilometer radius of the affected farm. A farm in Seotcheon, also in Chungcheong Namdo, is also suspected of having been infected with the virus. And earlier in the day, the first suspected bird flu case in Korea's central Gyeonggi-do province was reported at a chicken farm in the city of Pyeongtaek. However, the first autopsy result shows there is a good chance that the ducks were not contaminated with the AI virus. With a growing fear of the bird flu virus spreading across the country just ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday, senior officials are doing their best to prevent further contamination. Yi dong Pil, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, said the spread can be halted if everyone works together. I ask for your active cooperation in preventative measures during trips to your hometowns this Lunar New Year holiday, even if it's inconvenient. Minister Yi asked people to avoid visiting poultry farms and migratory bird habitats if possible. He also requested that stock breeding farms sterilize their farms and the surrounding areas and immediately report any suspicious cases. Officials from the government, the ruling Senuri Party and the presidential office of Cheongwade called an emergency meeting on Tuesday to coordinate efforts as they try to stem the spread of the bird flu outbreak that was first detected less than two weeks ago. Kwon Soa. Arirang News. Moving on to another story. Months after allegations surfaced that a far-left political party was staging an armed rebellion against the South Korean government, the legal process of disbanding the party got underway on Tuesday. Korea's Minister of Justice made the case for the government, while the Unified Progressive Party's chairwoman stood up for her side. Our Kim Anju reports on the first day of this unprecedented trial. In the first day of the high-profile trial on Tuesday, Justice Minister Hwang Kyo-wan made his case against the far-left Unified Progressive Party, while UPP Chairwoman Lee Jong-hee spoke up in defense of her party. The case represents the first time the government has attempted to dissolve a political party. The cabinet petition to disband the leftist party was filed in early November. A few months after, a number of UPP members, including lawmaker Lee Seok-gi, were arrested on charges of plotting an armed revolt against the South Korean government. E and other Unified Progressive Party members are currently standing trial, but are denying the insurrection charges and that they ever even praise North Korean ideology. Tuesday's trial was focused on whether it is lawful to dissolve the UPP, and if so, on what grounds. The Justice Ministry called for uprooting the leftist party, saying that the UPP seeks to install North Korean socialism, which violates the basic democratic order of the South Korean constitution. It also demanded the court put a temporary stop to the UPP's activities, as a party may attempt to subvert the government, as seen in the case of lawmaker Lee Seok-gi. The Unified Progressive Party rebutted the government's claim that their party is unconstitutional. It said its style of progressive democracy is aimed at overcoming the ills of capitalism, not following North Korean socialism. The UPP also claimed that the government is trying to suppress a minor opposition party out of a desire to drive its own political interests. UPP lawmaker Lee Seok-gi is awaiting a verdict on charges of plotting to overthrow the government. That verdict is expected to come in February which observers say is likely to influence the direction of the Constitutional Court's ruling on the UPP dissolution case. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. Shifting gears now, the National Assembly's Environment Committee has released its plans for dealing with the rising levels of air pollution in the country, which have prompted two ultra-fine dust advisories this month alone. Our Kim Young gil has more. The particles are thinner than a hair, and they've been blowing into Seoul for months, choking pedestrians and lowering visibility. 
the fine particulate matter is officially known as PM2.5. After their size, 2.5 micrometers in diameter or smaller. Once they get into the lungs, they could cause cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, lung cancer, and can even be deadly. The Parliamentary Environment Committee says it's working on plans for dealing with the problem and offered a progress report on Tuesday. Starting 2015, the government will regulate PM2.5 pollutants as hazardous. These include vehicle exhaust, smoke from factories, nitrogen, and sulfur oxide gas emissions. But we also plan to regulate restaurants that use charcoal grills. Korea's environment minister believes that of the 23-thousand tons of particulate matter emitted in metropolitan areas in 2010, some 22 percent were from restaurants that used charcoal grills. Seoul saw its highest dust level in 2012 with 25.2 micrograms per cubic meter of air, while Paris and New York have 15 and 13.9 micrograms respectively. The World Health Organization's recommended level is 25 micrograms per cubic meter per day. But some studies have shown there is no PM level at which there is no damage to health. To better manage the city's air pollution, the government plans to limit ultra-fine dust levels to 20 micrograms per cubic meter in urban areas starting 2015. The government is also aiming to increase the ratio of eco-friendly cars to 20 percent by 2024. It says it will also issue toxic dust forecasts twice a day starting in 2015 and will increase the number of toxic dust monitoring stations from 30 to 34. To combat Korea's growing air pollution problem, the Parliamentary Environment Committee plans to expand its research into ultra-fine dust. It might also form a joint research group with China and Japan. Kim young Arirang News. While Korea's overall labor market conditions have improved considerably since the global financial crisis of 2007, the pace of job creation for the nation's youth remains sluggish, and that is the topic of our In the Spotlight today. And the prospects are gloomy. To explain why and what's being done about it, we are now joined by our Hwang Ji-hae at the News Center. Ji-hae, let's start, with off, start off rather with the nation's youth, un, youth employment rate last year, which came in at the lowest level ever. Yes, Daniel, the employment rate for people between the ages of 15 and 29 stood at 39.7 percent last year, falling below 40 percent for the first time ever. This stands in contrast to the nation's overall employment rate, which actually rose 0.2 percentage points in 2013 from a year earlier. The number of young workers last year also dropped for the 21st rate year to slightly less than 3.8 million. And this year, outlook for the younger generation of Koreans is not all that bright either. Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry data shows that the number of new employees that 500 major companies decided to hire this year through January 15th dropped one and a half percent from 2013 to slightly over 30,000. Many college graduates and students who are in their last year of college say that landing a job is a daunting task. I thought English was my biggest barrier to getting a job, so I applied for an exchange student program, although I'm not that young. I'm now preparing for other certificates and attending academies. These days, young people aim to get a professional and stable job, and to do so, they study very hard and prepare for a much longer period of time than before. Now, I think it's also uh, important to note here that, uh, Jihei, that here in this country, many, if not most, college grads actually want to work for a large company rather than startups or entrepreneurship. So how does that factor into the low employment rate? It's a major factor, as you've just seen. And, and in fact, experts say it's the main reason the nation's youth employment rate is lower compared to other OECD countries. When young people look for a job, they think about the salary, but also about their future career path since they just started working. In that regard, they prefer to gain employment at a large company or state-run corporation. 
Young people spend four years in college and they spend another couple of years actually getting a job. Because the younger people are remaining economically inactive for a longer period of time, it's natural that the employment rate of the age group will drop. Well, I wish they could be a little bit less brand conscious. In a more macroeconomic sense, how does the low employment rate of the younger generation affect the Korean economy, Jie? Daniel, Daniel, in the short term and on a smaller scale, it's obviously a burden to the livelihoods of the young people and their families. But in the long term, it's a factor that could erode the nation's competitiveness as the difficulties that younger people are facing now could affect their economic activities throughout their lifetime. More young people without jobs for a long period of time means that they're losing the opportunity to raise their labor competitiveness by working. That will have a negative impact on the overall labor force of Korea in the long term. So I suppose, Ji the million dollar question is uh, what needs to be done to pump some life into the sluggish youth employment rate? Well, a recent report by the Korea Development Institute says that the government should review its current support programs so that they better cater to the youth who fail to land a job despite their job seeking efforts. In order to boost entrepreneurship among younger people, it says the government should make related training and education more readily available to students, even to those as young as middle schoolers. The Korean government, meanwhile, has made raising the nation's youth employment rate a major part of its three-year economic innovation plan set to be unveiled by the end of next month. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. Definitely an issue of concern, not just for the people looking for work, but the nation as a whole. Thank you, Jihye, for that report. That was our Hwang Jihye reporting live on the bleak job market situation for Korea's young job seekers. <laughs> Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. More and more people in Korea are falling ill with a severe bout of the flu, and you can count me in that. And with young students heading back to school after the winter break, there are concerns that the number of cases could skyrocket in the days to come. Our Kim ji reports. Kim seon lang brought her three-year-old son to the hospital after he showed no signs of improvement, despite taking medication for over a week for what she thought was a common cold. Kim's son had a high fever reaching close to 40 degrees Celsius, coupled with severe coughing. The hospital confirmed he'd come down with pneumonia, a much more serious illness. I was alarmed when the hospital said he had pneumonia. Like Kim's son, the number of people showing symptoms of high fever, throat pains and bodily fatigue are on the rise in Korea. Last week, around 30 people came down with a severe case of the flu, and a flu warning was issued last month over three strains, including the potentially deadly H1N1 virus. What appears to be cold symptoms can lead to complications and turn into pneumonia and ear infections. There's also a condition called Rye syndrome that could potentially harm the brain. Local authorities say the number of cases is nothing to be worried about at the moment, but with children heading back to school after the winter break, and millions of people planning to travel back to their hometowns for the Lunar New Year holidays, the number of cases could spike over the next few days and weeks. Experts say a patient suffering from a fever over 38 degrees Celsius should be taken to see a doctor, and the public should pay special attention to washing their hands thoroughly throughout the day. Meanwhile, health officials in the U.S. state of California say almost 150 people have died from the flu so far this month. Kim ji Arirang News. Well, here in Seoul, it was another mild winter day, and I hear we can look forward to more of the same in the days to come.
Well, let's find out for how long by going over to our Kim Bogyong at the Weather Center. Bogyong, what's the latest? Well, Daniel, temperatures rose to 3 degrees this afternoon here in Seoul and up to 15 in Busan. And it looks like these higher than the seasonal average readings will stick with us over the Lunar New Year holiday. However, keep in mind that although temperatures will remain favorable, there are looks to be showers over the extended weekend, except on Lunar New Year Day, which is Friday. Other than that, a dry weather warning has been issued in Gyeongsangbukdo province. So if you're in that region, please watch out for forest fires. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul reaches 7 degrees while cities down south make it to the low to mid-teens. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Dokdo peak at 9 degrees while Mankumgang tops out at zero. Well, that's all I have for you this hour and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Po Gyeong. And that brings us to the end of this early edition at 6. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gwan Young. Thank you, as always, for being here with us. Have a wonderful rest of the evening, and we'll see you right back here, same time, tomorrow. Good night.